mean, because I'm not going to say that. In the past four or five months in British Columbia, there has been an explosion of awareness of delinquency. Freely. The other which we deal superficially in Vancouver have been getting worse and worse and worse and worse. The inability of the federal government to do anything effective whatsoever about the adult prostitution on the streets not only of Vancouver but other places in British Columbia. I happen to think that there is a straightforward, simple, logical move which can deal with adult prostitution at least to bring it under control for the benefit of decent citizens of the city. But there is another problem which is even more horrifying, and that is the presence on the streets, not only of Vancouver, of the kiddie hookers, the kiddies used for personal pornography, the 8-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, and 13-year-olds, about whom it would seem we are powerless up to now to do very little indeed. Provincial government, with its usual arrogance, washes its hands of the matter. The federal government, with its usual incompetence and lily-livered gutlessness, refuses to face the matter whatsoever. Well, my particular explosion of awareness was highlighted by the presence of a woman on my program. A woman, Linda Halliday of Sava, Sexual Abuse Victims Anonymous. She has not been anonymous about the abuse which put her on this line to inform the public. And she appeared on the program here in the middle of January. And I want to show you three letters that we got about that program, three of many letters. And the first one goes like this. I was abused four times between the age of five to 15 by four different men. For the most, I kept quiet about it, and the problem went away. But the pain is still there, especially when the topic comes up like today. Scores of letters like that, but watch this next letter. Child abuse is the worst thing I know. It's corruption and a very bad thing. I think we should join and let the love flow, and together all our hearts can sing. From a 10-year-old. And at the other end of a spectrum, this letter. <coughs> I wish I could donate more to your cause. I am an old age pensioner and nearly blind. This is to Linda Halliday. God bless you. And it came from Courtney. So we're going to first talk to Linda Halliday this morning. And then we're going to talk to a woman who is an expert and has had considerable success dealing with the hardcore juveniles with their problems on the streets of this part of the world. And she is... Nona Thompson of the Step Up School, and Nona's proud boast, and it's verifiable, is that she's had 283 graduates from her Step Up School, and only 18, 18, are in jail. And Nona's going to be asked by me the very blunt question, why in all that's holy can't we do more about this exploding problem of the kiddie hookers Kitty perverts, kitty whatever, on the streets of our province. But we're going to start with Linda Halliday of Sava after the break. <music> Linda Halliday of Sava is an acknowledged expert in how to cope with perhaps I should put it this way, the disciplinary side of catching offenders of sexual abuse, correct? Partially, yeah. But first of all, I don't want you to bury your soul all over again, but you're the woman who sat here and told me that you'd been abused by your father and your grandfather and that your sisters hated you and your family cut you off. Yes, that's right. Um, my family, I speak with one sister now. That's one thing I would really like to stress with the amount of letters we've had, many of uh, victims of sexual abuse say, well, she came public and she seems all better, so that must be what I have to do. The only reason I came public, it took eight years to make that decision. It wasn't an easy one. 
The only reason I did come public as public as I have is so that the other people that have been victims don't have to do it. Because you're, the prejudice you run into, you lose your family, even 20 years since the abuse has happened, they're still very angry at you for exposing all this. You uh, also have people that will no longer have coffee with you because you're very public and they don't want anyone to think you ha that they have a problem like that. So there's a lot of repercussions that do come with it. All right, from the last appearance on the program, you got a flood of mail. Unfortunately, you also got some money. Yes, we did. We averaged 20, at least 20 letters per day for three solid weeks. We had approximately six to seven thousand dollars in donations from all over the province, Washington State, and the Yukon. Does this mean, though, that we were that we were then tapping this explosion of awareness and bringing people out of the closet oh. who had problems or merely wanted to join in this kind of what's the word uh, self uh, conviction of the problem? Both, both. We had about sixty percent of the letters were from people that had been victimized, male and female. Uh, I would say approximately, it was 50-50 on the money sent in, male and female, that sent donations in. Uh, we had everything from a $2 donation right up to a $1,000 donation from individuals. And we have groups and organizations that are raising funds through raffles and, and stuff like that for us. Now, you're not concentrating so much as on the victims on the street till they come by you. You're concentrating on the people whose lives have been twisted because of the initial incestuous approaches. Let's talk about incest. Yeah. In the first instance? Yes, any trust relationship that is broken by sexual abuse is what we deal with. All right, let's take it right specific. We, don't have, we can go back to your case if you wish, but you say the darkest nights, so this says here, the darkest nights are the ones that end in tears. Turn on the lights and ask someone for help. How in the name of all that's holy can a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old turn on the lights and ask for help? I have most of my clients that are coming in now that are presently in an abusive situation are five years old and younger. And I have taken... How do they get to you? Mom, some t dads are bringing them in now uh, where it's been mom's boyfriend or somebody else that's been abusing the children. After the show, I had a father bring two children up from another community. The little boy is two and the little girl is three. The three-year-old, I have a seven-page statement from that little girl and very explicit detail. Uh, if, the ch if you take the time with the children, you see the difference between what we do and what, say, human resources. Human resources deals with all kinds of problems. They deal with financial and all the other problems. We deal with nothing but sexual abuse. So in three years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that's all we deal yeah, with. Yeah, but that's, how can you get that? I mean, let's be reasonable. How can you get a seven-page statement from a three-year-old child who's Asking been abused questions. within the family? Asking questions. Using and, the dolls. And the dolls. We have dolls with all the parts. They show us on the dolls what's happened. Plus, I ask them questions. I write the question down and the answer down. And kids are very, very explicit at what happens. And then what do you do? In that particular, well, we better not talk about that particular case, but any of these cases that they came to you, are they capable of being brought to what, quote, a mm -hmm. successful conclusion in front of the courts? OK, this is where we really run into the problem. Uh, children of, quote, tender years cannot be sworn in in court. If we do, they, the new law says we don't need cooperation anymore. But we do need cooperation under the law still. A judge will not convict on the word of a three-year-old or a four-year-old. What about a videotape taken at the time? We unfortunately do not have a video. We're trying to raise money to have a video so we can video the initial interview and introduce that into court. Not necessarily as the main evidence, but as a tool so the judge can see for himself what the child depicted to us that took place. That would be invaluable. So far, we haven't been able to do that because we have to rent a video and we never know when we're going right, to have a We child. come to the older cases now. We come to the 12-year-olds, the 13-year-olds, the 15-year-olds mm -hmm. who are being abused within the family. What would you tell a 14-year-old who's been abused, say, by a father or by a grandfather or by cousins or babysitters or what? One of the most important things is prosecution. And the reason I say that isn't throw them in jail forever and ever. But these sex offenders, there is no cure for, and I firmly believe that, and the experts will... Verify oh, you're that. speaking heresy, Linda Hallett. Uh, what do you mean? There's a, a new psychological program I saw announced the other day for the Pacific Regional Business where they want to take these less aggressive offenders at Mountain Prison and show them the results of it and attempt to measure their sexual response to the situations which turned them on. That's right. The thing is, there's no cure, but there's treatment. 
where they can learn behavior modification, and that's basically what that program is. You approve of that kind of behavior modification? It's the only way we're, we don't know what works. Average reoffense rate is three years, even after treatment. Success rate. Average reoffense. The yes. next offense after one is three years. Now, you had a couple of stories you were telling me before on the air about punishments given to people, in which I think you were irate about the lack of proper punishment. That's Be right. Be specific. Okay. What I would like to see is in indeterminate, indeterminate sentencing so that they could be ordered into treatment. If That's they don't the take treatment. That's the old DSO thing, the old dangerous yeah. sexual offender thing. That's right. And you see, they still have to volunteer for treatment. Well, no, very few offenders will volunteer for treatment. And if they don't have treatment and aren't ordered into treatment, there's very little chance of them recovering at all. They'll continue abusing okay. children. Okay, we're all being incredibly pro very proper and reasonable. There's a clipping here that you brought this morning about a former local citizen of the year in the island who got a s suspended sentence That's for right. sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl. He was 61. That's right. Um, is that enough from your no, point of view? No, it is not. Not enough. No. Should be a jail sentence. It should be at least a jail sentence where there is treatment available. I stress that. And if there's no treatment available, that, if that was a first offense, maybe that's not too bad. I don't believe that's a first offense with anybody at the age of 61. We see patterns, generational abuse, over and over again. That may be the first time he's been caught. 41-year-old carpenter with a history of sex crimes. Previous record of two counts of gross indecency, indecent assault on a male, indecent assault on a female, breaching the Juvenile Delinquent Acts, this time sexually assaulting a 12-year-old boy. He got, what did he get? Two months. Two months. That's right, and if you read the bottom statement from the press, it says that, that was, the judge felt that, that was, he had to protect the public. Two months is not enough. He can be out in a third of his time. And there's no mention of treatment again. So there's a good chance, and with his record, he will offend again. Well, the way you're talking, we could fill half the jails with sexual offenders. Does it, does it not hit a specific class of the community? No, it does not. All classes, um, economical, it doesn't matter. S uh, natural fathers have been, the, in our records, are the highest offenders, but stepfathers are charged more often. We've also found generational abuse, incredible like going from one generation to the other. The more people that keep the secret, the more victims there are within the family. In other words, it passes on through the kids. If a That's child's right. abused, that child grown up will abuse. That, not necessarily, if it isn't dealt with, and I stress that. If sexual abuse is dealt with appropriately, that person can come out fine. Like these kids we're seeing at four and five years old have a really good chance of coming out fine. But you've got to make them know it's wrong. The offender know it's wrong. And the children. Yes, the children should be taught that people can't do this to them. That is their body and they have the right to say who touches them. Stand by Linda Halliday of Sava. We're going to talk next to Nona Thompson of, Op of Step Up School. Then we'll have them both together and we'll have your calls and their experience and their advice and guidance and who knows what. After the break. For 12 years, uh, Nona Thompson has been running the Step Up, Step Up School, with considerable success. But let me ask you, for, forget about your brief to Fraser's Committee, forget about everything else. Let me ask you one simple question. To the average person sitting at home watching the television or reading the newspaper, they are appalled by the fact that we, the community, seems to be powerless to see 12, let's not talk about the occasional 8-year-olds, but 12 to 15-year-olds peddling their bodies any which way on the streets. Why can't we get these kids off the streets? We could easily, Jack. There's been, those kids were identified a long time ago. Those kids were identified as high-risk kids when they were very, very young by public health nurses, by kindergarten teachers, by elementary school teachers. They, if you look back at the files on these kids, you'll find that they had all kinds of requests for help and nothing was done for them. The teacher had nobody to help her with handling the kid who was having a great deal of difficulty. Maybe we should just write them off. Well, the minute, by the time the kid gets on the street, you almost are writing him off and her off. 
because what you're saying is that you've really failed, that all of the clues were there from day one, and many of those kids were the, the children of 15-year-old mums, and there were no support systems for those mums. Those were kids that really, really cried out for help for a long time. Are you time. saying that some of the kids on the streets are the childs of 15-year-old mums of before? I'm saying that the kids on the street were our high-risk kids. Many of them were born to very young mothers. In other words, this is the generational aspect from generation to generation, a code of conduct shows up in the people you've seen and worked with on the streets as well as in Halliday Saba. That's right, They're, but not all of them, but a lot of these kids. And some of these, many of these kids are severely learning disabled. They cannot read and write and do arithmetic. They were identified at four, five, six, and seven years of age. And requests were made for individual help for those kids, for one-to-one -one workers for those kids. And as you know, as the support services dry up, we're going to have more and more kids. My waiting list gets longer and longer, Jack. About 10, 12, 15, even 20 years yeah. ago, I remember doing programs for this hour of seven days about... 14, 15 year old homosexuals selling their little bodies in a pool hall at the corner of Granville and. Uh, I remember that well, Jack. Corner of Granville through the courthouse. Anyway, yeah. remember that? Yes, I do. But that was, that was an identifiable hot spot. Today, they're all over the place. Well, they're, they're, yes, they are all over the place, but this place that people get most concerned about is on Davy Street because they're bothering the, the neighbors and the residents on Davy Street. But there's still lots of kids, and there still were in those days in a lot of other places. But in those days, we hid them all in the world, put we, them oh in Willingdon, yes. Brannan right. Lake, whatever. Right. Yes, we don't have places to hide kids anymore. Very few. As you know, the containment center is full to overflowing. Wellington. Wellington, yeah. But, I mean, still, is it not any kind of an answer at all? If you had the right place to lift them off the street and say you're going to be there for six months and learn decent clean living am i just being stupid and old-fashioned yeah. yeah you're just being old-fashioned jet because kids are people live in their community and we're going to have to teach them how to have the job skills and the training in order for them to survive in that community those kids wouldn't be there if they could find another way out I mean, they don't want to be there jack how many kids do you handle in step up school we have 45 and we have a waiting list of over 200, Jack. Your graduates are what? Give me the figures. Graduates, we have 283 graduates from Step Up and only 18 in jail. Now, are many of these, while they're at Step Up, still prostituting on the streets? Some of them are still on the street, yes, Jack. Now, why would that be? Because... Well, you've got to earn a dollar, Jack. And if you can't earn a dollar any other way, that's what you're going to have to do. When it comes to child abuse in the family, uh, do the kids express any views on why they're doing it now? Well, we, I mean, we, know, we know of a of a lot of background of a lot of those kids who in fact have had a lot of abuse. Those were kids that really di don't feel, a lot of them don't feel very good about themselves. They feel that they're not really worth very much. Nobody for years of their life has ever told them they were wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you know they're all very wonderful. What do they respond if it's an incest case? What would they tell you or one of your workers in an incest case? I don't get into that Jack. We really pay attention to two hours a day on teaching kids how to read, write and do arithmetic so they can get some of the skills so they can find a way out. So they don't have to work the street. Yeah. Those kids would not be there, Jack, if they could see a way out. Okay, next question to you, Nona uh, Thompson. What did you suggest as the solutions to the Special Committee uh, on Pornography and Prostitution which asked you for a brief? I suggested that we provide very good backup services for the children who are labeled at high risk that we provide one-to-one -one help for that mom who's having a difficult time raising a kid. She's usually a single parent mom. Uh, also that we provide very good educational programs that teach kids at the learning styles. You know, kids don't learn, a lot of kids don't learn the way we teach in schools. And I suggested that instead of using the courts, because courts don't win with kids. Courts just, and, and the criminal justice system teaches kids how to be criminals. And if we have to, use the criminal justice system, we might as well throw away the key. And when we put that kid, we first of all You're put the You're telling me the, the criminal justice system appearing in front of a, a, a judge in a juvenile delinquency charge is really, in effect, for rehabilitation, a waste of time. Absolutely. Unless you can provide a service, a backup service, for instance, a school where the kid can learn some skills, you can provide services. Now, in Operation Step Up, what do you teach them? You don't go into high-grade academic intellectual programs. Well, we teach kids how to read and to write and to do arithmetic because the average reading grade of a student who arrives in Step Up is grade 3. The average age is 15. And if you're a 15-year-old kid and you are still reading at a grade 3 level, you haven't got much hope there on this for anything else but working the streets. You mean they're going on the streets because one, they're 
to put the usual old-fashioned word, they're totally misfits, they may have been abused, and on the streets they pay for it. That's right. Somebody else pays for it. Yeah, they'll tell you that. If you, I remember asking a kid a long, long time ago, 12 years ago, when I was really naive, and I said, why? Why do you prostitute? And she said, on the streets they pay for it. In other words, in the family circumstances, nobody paid for it, but on the streets they do. Y and you know, you've got to live, Jack. It makes you feel so helpless and hopeless and useless. No, doesn't it? it doesn't. There's all those wonderful kids out there that can be helped. Halliday and Thompson together and your contributions and their contributions after the break. I think it's fair to say right now, after hearing Nona and Linda, as Nona Thompson and Linda Halliday, that Nona tackles the problem and has had a successful step up from the point of view that she receives a product. And she does the best she can with that product to teach her to read, write, and count and find it a job or watch perhaps in the 18 out of the 250 to go back to jail. And Nona, you don't think with the court system that the distinct uh, penalty from the court system has really helped any of the people of, under your ages who've gone through the court system? Well, it's helped in one way in that they go on the waiting list for Step Up and then they finally get some educational help and that's the only way they get it. In order to get into Step Up, you have to be on probation, a school dropout and labelled hardcore. So she's dealing with the victim. You're concentrating on both the victim and the offender, is that's that correct? The family itself, yes. All right, now how do you feel about the involvement of the courts, especially where adults are have been molesting or incestuous behavior with kiddies. Very, very strongly. Uh, with offenders, you have to take away their power and control. The sex part has very little to do with it. There's lots of stuff out there they could get with consent, but they're looking for power and control. And what better way to get it than over a young child who loves and trusts them and is not going to reject them? I firmly believe that the only way an offender has to be ordered into treatment, he might go voluntarily for a short period of time, but he will not stick it through. Uh, with juveniles, for instance, with some of the kids I deal with, uh, if the, we tell them straight, you break the law, I'm going to turn you in. I would rather you went in and I'll go with you, but you break the law and you have to face the consequence because what happens with a lot of these kids is people are so busy making up for them for the abuse they went through that they let them get away with a lot of things. They never have to take responsibility for their own actions and it's a harsh way to do it. But we have also found that it's successful if they have a support. Well, your big success, or rather the explosion that you personally, that your organization caused was the fact that in, and give me the figures again, for the region in which you work, uh, compared to what happens in other jurisdictions of BC as to offenders charged, please. Okay, in the <coughs> eight years before we actually had an office, there was one family related sexual offense in the courts. In the past three years, since we've been in operation, there's been 75 charges. 50 have been totally processed, and there's a 78% conviction rate. Now, I don't do it alone. We have an excellent police force that works with us. We have excellent Crown Council. We work with very closely, and they have been very patient in teaching us how to work within the system. You're rooting out the offenders and abuse of children. Right. But as you're dealing with the net effect, it would seem, in how many, what proportion are you dealing with the offenders of sexual abuse, with the, the victims of sexual abuse on children? I don't know, Jack. I don't ask Roughly myself. speaking. I, I really don't know. I don't get into that because... I would suspect it's comparatively considerable. <coughs> Wouldn't you not, in your heart of hearts, feel that the one, or is it economic conditions? Well, it is a lot of things. I would say that that, that uh, you know, the sexual abuse has something to do with it, the physical abuse has something to do with it. But I've never blamed a mum, Jack, and I've never blamed a dad or whoever it was. You know, there are all kinds of reasons that make people do what they do. And our major job is to help somebody feel better about themselves, be it a mum or a dad, uh, anyone. What about you? I definitely blame the adult. I mean, the adult is the adult, and they're responsible for taking care and protecting that child. And the kid goes through life thinking, it's all my fault, it must have been something I wore, I said, I did that caused this to happen to me. But you still have a guilt complex on your back. You know that perfectly well. When you Intell sat here the last time right? and you said, to my astonishment and incredible, not disbelief, but to my astonishment, that you still love your father. That is something, the most common question I've heard uh, in the letters is, how can you love him after what he did to you? He is still how my can father. You? I remember the nightmare story you told me. That's right. If he attacked your sisters in mm -hmm. the same room, you felt guilty. Yeah. And if he attacked you, they hated you. Well, I've got to explain something. 
People can't understand it. They'll take a kid out of a home where they're being sexually abused. The kid will run back and they'll say, well, if it's that bad, they, why would they go back? Or mom will say, if he was abusing her, why is she cuddled up next to him on the couch? In my case, for instance, when I would go, dad would have to go out on the boat. And quite often, I would volunteer to go with him, not because I liked the abuse, but each time I was very idealistic and I thought, this time it'll be different. This time we'll just be father and daughter. And every time I was betrayed. Did you have an object? Protest? No. I just kept my mouth shut and I detached myself from what was happening. I was somewhere else when this was going on. At nine years old, I can remember thinking when my dad was abusing me, I'd think, well, I'm a prostitute and when this is over, I'll have $50. And I would go on a shopping spree, mentally. Did, uh, so I wouldn't have to deal with what was happening. Uh, oh, no. No, but this is what I did to just, you know, to make me rationalize okay. it in your own mind. Yeah. And these kids, when their dad goes to jail, for instance, they go through hell, they go through guilt, the whole thing. And dad, quite often the daughter will be the first one to write and everything else. But suddenly dad becomes safe to love. He's behind bars, she can make him anything he wants and he's safe. I had to come to terms with my father and people have asked me about my feelings. I think the biggest thing I feel for him is pity. And I have a letter that I have written when I finally came to terms in 1982 with my feelings on dad. And if you would like, I'll share this with the... Yeah. And then we can take a break? Yeah. Okay. Dear Dad, I've often thought of writing to you, but knowing Mom as I do, I know you would never read it. Mom has an inborn need to shelter and protect you from all that upsets you. Many times each day I think of you and wish you and I could sit and talk openly and honestly with each other. I would love to have a father-daughter relationship that is honest. I know that cannot be a reality, but it's one thing I would like. I have been told I'm out for revenge. I've done a lot of thinking about that, and I can honestly say that is not true. I was very idealistic, and I had this dream that offenders could be confronted, would willingly enter therapy, and the family unit conti could continue. The more I worked with sexual abuse, the more victims I dealt with, and the more offenders I saw, the more I understood. You see, Dad, I do understand the reasons now. Mind you, just because I understand it doesn't make it any easier to accept. Still, there are a lot of questions in my mind. Dad, did you feel so powerless in your life outside the house that you had to maintain total power and control in your home? Believe me, I understand the overwhelming need to have power and control in your life. I understand how easy it is to abuse the trust of a child who thinks you're great, but I cannot and will not accept what you did. As a child, as your daughter, you were the one person I felt I could depend on, look up to, and trust. You, Dad, destroyed that. You, Dad, took that from me. I guess what makes me angry with you isn't the abuse, isn't the misuse of power. It's the fact that you took away my childhood. You destroyed my trust. You took away my rights to be a daughter. And the saddest part is you took away my father. I don't hate you. Sometimes I wish I did. But I do hate what you did to me. Funny, I remember all the times you were just Dad and you were such a good, kind father. Why did you have to take that away from me? Was the need for power and control so strong you're willing to risk the destruction of a child's love and trust? Dad, you have so many good qualities, but that flaw in your makeup created so much hell for four little girls that just wanted a father. I've been asked if I hated you. No, Dad, the strongest feeling I have for you is pity. Yes, pity, Dad, for you've lost something very special and very precious, your daughter. I feel sorry for you that you never saw your oldest grandson graduate with honors. I feel sorry for you that you'll never see your granddaughter on her wedding day that you'll not know the joy of hearing your daughter say I love you in your aging years, that you'll never know the proud person that I, your daughter, have become. Yes, Dad, I do feel sorry for you because you gave up something precious and beautiful for your selfish gratification and greed for power. I also have to thank you, Dad, strange as it may seem, for the strength that I now have, for the understanding I now have about sexual abuse, and for the compassion I feel for families caught up in sexual abuse. Dad, I've been asked what fantasy I have of what I'd like to do to you if I could. Well, I've given that a lot of thought, and believe it or not, there's not one punishment I could think of that would give me any sort of gratification. You've lost so much, Dad, never knowing me, your daughter. I'm a person now I know you would be proud to know. You've taught me to have the courage of my convictions, and I now do. Dad, I believe in what I'm doing, I believe my work is important, and I believe victims of sexual abuse should have an alternative to self-destruction. A minister once said, there would be more courageous people if courage wasn't such a lonely thing. I really believe in what I'm doing. I believe in me at long last. Yes, Dad, you are the loser. You've lost a daughter that cares, feels, loves, and for the first time in her life feels good when she looks in the mirror. Anger, revenge, hatred, spite, those have passed. And at long last, at 35 years of age, I've ended my long search. I have found inner peace. 
I'm letting you go, Dad, and in doing so, I found a serenity I didn't know existed. And, Dad, it feels so right and so free. Goodbye to the father who never was. Mm. Yeah. Uh, did you send it? No, my mother would never let it get through to him. After the break. Where do you go from here in this kind of discussion? I don't know. I really don't know. Well, I mean, I, I'm almost speechless at this kind of... We know the problems exist. We know that the streets of Vancouver, and I've been very guilty of talking about diseased pests in the street, which is unfair. I shouldn't say that, should I? But it's true. But look at the, you know, the Vancouver Sun has at long last wakened up to a problem on Davie Street. And I write the most gruesome page one articles the other day about PID. Did you see that, Em? Do you see that article? Even though it's true. At least the old police licensing system got the prostitutes into the jails for some medical treatment, did it not? Yes, yes. Well, I'm going to. This is a prearranged call from a mother with a problem. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello, Jack. Where is your. Up a little louder, please. Hello, Jack. Where is your daughter now? My daughter is on Davy Street. How old is she? She's 14. How the devil did it happen? Uh, she was in a group home, and she ran away. She <coughs> ran away to Davy Street, and... Um, Do you see her at all nowadays? Uh, no, I haven't seen her for a couple of weeks. So, was, was, have you a husband in the family, or are you a single parent? I'm a single parent. And as I recall, you're a single parent who has a steady job. That's right. And uh, did, I always have had. Did she get out of control at some time or another? Yes, I had disciplinary problems with her at home. Only child? Yes. And so when, she, when did she first start to cause the problems, uh, not being in on time and the rest of it? Well, I have had disciplinary problems with her for a couple of years now, but things really got... Um, out of hand last November. She was at school at the time? She was in school, yes. And, was, she, and that, was that when she went down to Davy Street? Yes. Yes, it was... Um, so while she was at school, she was down on Davy Street, is that right? Well, her, her school attendance was rather spotty. She wasn't going every day. She missed, um, she missed about three weeks. Uh, and tell me, did you go to Human Resources and did they put her in the foster home? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Did Human Resources put her in the foster home when you told them you couldn't control her? Yeah, well, she was in a group home. She was in a group home, and she ran away. She Classic. ran away from it. And then, then did she run away? Did she learn about prostitution in the group home? I would suspect because there was never anything that severe when she was at home. Now, let me, let me get Nona to talk to you and Linda to talk to you. What advice would you give to this mother now? Obviously, a, a decent, respectable woman, a child who has got discipline problems, goes to the group home, finishes up in Davy Street. What does she do now? Write off her daughter? No, I don't think she should write off her daughter, but will her daughter come and talk to her? Will your daughter talk to you? Um, she probably would talk to me if, uh, if she could really be found. The, the problem seems to be that she doesn't want any sort of authority figure involved in her life. She doesn't want the structured school system. She doesn't want the Ministry of Human Resources. She doesn't want home because there are rules here. And furthermore, it, I'm not being critical, but you are a single parent and there's not, never been a husband in the picture. That's right. No father figure. Now, is that part of the problem, Nona? Well, it's very difficult to be a single parent mom. Uh, and, and moms have uh, needed a lot of support in order to raise kids. And if they don't have that and they're working, and, and, and you know, they can't provide all the systems that kids need, and if school is not a good place for a kid to be, because all kids want to be in school, they want to be successful in school, they also want to please a mom, and they want a mom to love them, and they want to be loved. All right, how does she get this 14-year-old off Davy Street? How does anybody get that off Davy Street? That's what the well, mother wants to know. How about you, Linda? 
uh, with a lot of these kids until they're willing to start getting help, there's not a thing you can do. You mean it's like drinking and smoking? That's right. Except I mean, you can do everything possible for a kid, but if they don't want help, they're going to tell you where to go. Yeah, but they also want to know there's a way out. And they want to know that they, in fact, can succeed somewhere. Was, was, did she, when she went to school, regular school, elementary school, did she do well? Hey, eh? Did she do well in school? Um, I wouldn't say she did well. She was around average. Yeah, but did you have a fairly stable life at home? You didn't have a succession of boyfriends coming through, did no. you? No, nothing like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I was home with this child because that's where I thought I should be when I wasn't working. Yeah. Uh, I, Has she ever asked her about sexual abuse? Has she ever been sexually abused at any time, says no. Linda Holiday? No. No. Okay, well, listen, we're sorry for you, but what did she do? Did she come and see you, Nona? She certainly can come and see me. I yeah. average three visitors a day at Step Up. What's your phone number? It's 874-2411. And we're at 550 West 10th Avenue in Vancouver, and we have a lot of visitors. I talk to people all the time, and we'll I'm more put, than we'll, happy. We'll, we'll put up that not telephone number for you later on. Will you call Nona and see what she can recommend locally? Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Now, here's a different one on uh, 12. This is from a man with a problem of uh, one of his... How old is your child when it was abused? Hello? Hello there. How old was your... How old is the child involved in your problem? Uh... Two and a half years old. Oh, tell me the little story, please. Um, we had a cousin staying with us. Uh-huh. And uh, he would babysit for me and the wife when we'd go shopping or going to bingo. And we never found out until a few months later what had been going on, and we just found out by accident. What had been going on? Some specific abuse of the child? <laughs> well, uh, um, playing with my daughter, eh? How old is this cousin? The fellow? Yeah. He's 27 years old. 27 years old, and did you face, did you tackle him on the topic? Yes, I, t I, I approached him on it, and he ran out of the house, like, uh, when he'd come to the house one day, and I, we so, found this out, eh? So you, your t child told you, so you went to the police? Yes. And what did the police do? The police, uh, and MHR got involved in it, and they, they came to the house with the little dolls and that. Right. And the little girl showed them everything that the fellow had done to her. And uh, that was the last time MHR was in it, and this was in, I think, the end of November. Right. And so uh, the police officer that was investigating had got this woman from MHR was supposed to come out, and they were talking about a video session in that. Mm-hmm. And the woman never, ever showed up from MHR. Was the man charged? The man was picked up. He denied it. Right. And uh, he said he'd even take the polygraph test. And did he? He took the polygraph test, yes. And did he fail it or pass it? He failed it. He failed the polygraph test? Yes, and he's still walking the streets. He's going around telling everybody no, that be because he's on the streets that he passed the test, and there's no damn way I can do anything about it. And what do the police tell you? What about the Crown Council? What do they tell you? Nothing. You phoned them? The, I talked to the police officer, and he said they can't do nothing unless the fellow admits to to doing it. Okay, let's put that to Linda Holiday. There's your classic case, a two and a half year old, the, the innocent child, and the child is totally innocent, right. describes by the dolls the, 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 the whatever it was against her. And the police say, he failed the polygraph test, but no independent corroboration. He gets away with it scot-free then, doesn't he? Sometimes. Uh, a lot of times they'll have to wait until he does it again, unfortunately. What happens if there's a sex offender in your neighborhood, a child molester in your neighborhood, everybody's ready to kill him. If it's in the family, he's sick, needs help. In this particular case, it isn't that way, but this happens a lot. With our big problem is the Evidence Act is going to have to be looked at in sexual abuse cases because our children are younger and younger that are now talking about it. There's a lot of TV stuff and, and advertising that tells kids to tell. Okay, they tell and nothing's done. What are you saying to the kid? And what am I supposed to say to a parent? Am I supposed to say, if your child's under 11, don't talk about it because we don't have enough to do anything? That's what's been done for years. And that's why we've got all these screw-ups that we're seeing in society with the jails and the alcohol, the drugs, the prostitution. A high percentage of all these things are interconnected with children being abused at home. There has to be treatment um, for offenders. There has to be support services for victims and for parents like this. Now, he's getting very frustrated. 
Well, and I don't blame him. Yeah, and don't I don't blame, blame him. In the slightest. Now I'm telling you. If you parents, saw the guy in the street, you'd be tempted to clout him. Sure. And the kid sees him on the street, and they're saying, "Well, why did I bother telling? He's still walking around. Nothing is being done. This child is young enough." What I'm advising parents to do is, yes, definitely report it, and hopefully we can get enough evidence that we can take it to court. In other words, if everybody reports a case of abuse, whether it's generational in a family or That's outside. Right. At least if the police and the investigating authorities keep proper, proper records, you can see a pattern of behavior which That's builds right. the case. That's right. And the thing is, that guy will do it again, and he will be caught okay, again. Okay, another question now to this parent here. How do they now handle their two-and-a-half-year-old, eh? Get her into play therapy. There's a couple of organizations here in Vancouver. One's Act Two, and one is um, VSAC. And those two organizations are right here in Vancouver and phone them and find out what's available. There's psychologists here in town that do deal with it, but we run into a problem there. Okay, one thing I would recommend to this father, it has been reported to the police. Put in an application to victims compensation, victims of crime, and get them to pay for the therapy for their little girl. Do you hear that? Criminal Injuries Compensation Act. Yeah, if I, I would, hey, Have you done that? No, we've been waiting Write for... Write me a letter. Uh, uh, MHR to do something, but apparently they're not going to do anything, eh? Uh, do you work in an office? No, you don't. Uh, Pardon? Do you work in an office? No. The important thing is to put the circumstances down in writing. Uh -huh. Send it to me. Send it to Linda Halliday at Sava. Uh huh. We'll put the address up again and send copies to your RCMP, the uh, district superintendent of the RCMP in Vancouver, if it's in this area. Uh huh. The attorney general, almost. MHR, the Minister of uh, Grace McCarthy in Victoria, send the registered letters and ask for a reply, okay? Uh -huh. And a copy to me too. And thanks for your participation. More calls after the break. Have we enough knowledge and experience in any specific cases, Linda Halliday, to track generational abuse? Definitely. We're doing a lot of work on that now, and I've just released a paper. You take, for instance, the grandma and grandpa. They have four children. Grandpa abuses the two daughters in the family. Now, the one daughter marries a guy 20 years older who has two children of, her own, of his own. The, uh, she devotes herself totally to the church so she ha doesn't have to deal with anything. The other daughter mar marries, she has four children. Her two daughters are abused by the grandfather also. How many generations does this go down altogether now? This we have tracked, uh, the general is four generations before it's exposed. And everybody keeps the secret. The more people that keep the secret, the more kids are gonna be abused. You'd agree with that? Education. It's not an easy answer, Jack. Didn't well, let's go to the phones. Do try and keep your experiences, your comments brief. I'd like to get through a fair number of phones this morning, just to see if both my experts are right on the bit in your view. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Okay, yes, I got a bombshell for you. Right. Uh, Mrs. Thompson, first off, I want to take my hat off to you. I think what you are doing is fantastic. I was molested when I was eight years old. I was raped when I was 12 in a Vancouver lockup. I turned into Vancouver's worst juvenile delinquent. I started to uh, use drugs at 16 and uh, kept on going. I was a pimp downtown. I had about three girls running for me. They were ages 13 to 17 at that time. And I really, really, what really changed me is where I, I more or less pulled it out myself. I came out of this myself, but I did have the hand of the one-on-one -on -one relationship. Uh, where someone took the time out and spent time with me for three months straight, steady. I couldn't even go out of arm's reach of this person. And where this communication, I wouldn't trust anyone after I got raped in the Vancouver. I was raised when I was 14 in the Vancouver... Um, raised to adult court. That's correct. And uh, Vancouver jail cell. And uh, that's when this... This untrusting of anyone, I wouldn't trust anyone afterwards, and it was more of all a front uh, that I would put up in front of people. And I really, uh, really do 
know for a fact that you got to get these children, what they'll say to you on the street is, hey, what do you got better to offer me? I've got money, I've got my drugs, I've got uh, everything. What else better are you going to offer me? And um, mm-hmm. you've got to get that trust. You've got to show them that this trust and communication and a real love and friendship. Question and from, from me. How old are you now? I'm 25. So you were a pimp when you were, what, 16 or 17? No, I was 18 at the time. Let me ask Nona about that. Do you find that people, that youngsters graduate as child prostitutes to be in pimps? Yeah, well, what else can you do? You know, you really don't see an out, and an option. And I want to say to you on the telephone that I think it's just wonderful that, uh, that you had somebody that you could trust in three months. But who did he have? <coughs> How, who, who gave you the trustworthy friend? No, it was a four-star relationship. It was through a, a source called Browndale. If you ever have heard of it. Oh, I remember well, Brown Dale. Yes, I, I know. It. I know you don't think too highly of it, Mr. Uh, Mr. Webster. Well, they had some but financial I, uh, problems. I really do take off. My, they're the ones that made the difference in my life. Where they were instead that I uh, I would have been in jail. Put it this way, I would have been doing five years in Ocala when I was uh, 16. Indeed. And they were the ones that took the time out and decided to uh, really instead of the jail cells, they're going to give me one person. Mm-hmm. Right. One person, I couldn't go out of arm yeah. reach, I couldn't oh, go to the bathroom without him, nothing, I couldn't take a bath, is, uh, I had to just... You know, I remember Brown Deer well, it did some good work, but it ran into some other problems. Look, I'm really grateful you called this one. Mr. Webster, one thing I would like to say about that is that about you writing kids off, is that we're going to have to live with them eventually. And it's time that they got some uh, some real work done, some real... Agreed. The only reason I say, what do we do, write them off, is so that people out and can realize that unless we do something, we are in effect writing them off. Anywho. Yeah, well, they're just going to turn into a, like a Clifford Olsen eventually if they don't get the treatment that they really need. Okay. I was able to pull myself out of it. But these kids, some of these kids aren't as, well, I consider myself very intelligent. But and Browndale was the thing that gave you the help. The it started the ball rolling, put Good. it that way. I'm very grateful to you for your call. Thanks very much. Not easy to call a program and no, that took tell a lot of these courage. details. I really admire him. It, you know, molested at eight, raped in the Vancouver lockup at 12, drugs at 16, pimp at 18, well, three girls on a string, and Browndale came along, and I used to nag at them financially, I'll tell you. Go ahead, please. Hello. That's you, ma'am. I would like to give thanks to Linda for the help she has been to our family. And our sexual offender has been having a gay old time since for about 40 years. Right now, our children do not trust adults. He's been caught. But our children are being treated like criminals, and the offender sits at home in his rocking chair while we try to get him to trial. Oh, my God. How sick are the people that make the laws that protect these people? You mean your children are being questioned and grilled? Constantly. How long ago was this offense? Uh, It's been, uh, well, back and forth bouncing in the court system for about eight months now. Eight months now, and has the the accused appeared in court at all? Has he appeared? Oh, many a time, many a time. What's happening to the... postponed because we keep buying, or we keep trying to find more children, and they keep popping up. (laughs) Yeah. And then you mean there's more than two or three children involved in this case? Oh, yeah. Yes, there is. Linda? Yeah, uh, our involvement, she's from another community. She's not from our community. And what we can do, we do for people outside the community is advise them what's happening. We can act as a liaison for them, and that's what we've been doing with this family. They are a tremendous family. They've got a lot of strength. But the waiting is the worst. You see, these guys go in and out of court. They make a first appearance, and then they make a plea, and they appear with a lawyer, and then they change their plea, and it can drag on. In Campbell River, our longest has been 13 months before sentencing. Do you have any faith in the Crown in this particular case, ma'am? Absolutely none. None? Our children are being treated like they were the sexual offenders. How old are the children involved? Uh, it started with them at three years old. Uh, there's a four-year-old, a six-year-old, well, two four-year-olds, two six-year-olds, and a 43-year-old daughter yeah. who was abused for many years. And there's not enough evidence to bring it to trial? Oh, yeah. There is. There's charges, but what they're doing is making sure they have a solid case. Yeah, and we well, uh, just cr- feel that the, uh, all I do personally, that the, the laws are just kind of backing off. To me, this man should have been 
instead of sitting home in his rocking chair between these court sessions. Should be in jail without bail. He's, uh, he's out. But he should, you'd rather see him in jail without bail. I'm sorry? You'd rather see him in jail without bail. That's right. I don't want him hurting any more children the way he has done ours. Okay, ma'am, Linda will keep me in touch and thank you for your call. After the break, more calls. Question to Linda Halliday of Sava. Not all the offenders are grandfathers, fathers, or adults. Some yeah. are children. That's right, our young. What do you do if you come across a juvenile offender who's molesting smaller children? Well, most people ignore it. Like, okay, they walk in and here's a 12-year-old boy, for instance, molesting a 5-year-old girl or boy uh, in a babysitting situation. But because that boy, the offender is a friend of mom's, they'll say, oh, well, boys will be boys, or they'll ball the kid out and say, we don't want to see you anymore. If people would report that when they are 12 years old, we can prevent, possibly, with treatment, these kids from becoming adult offenders. Now, there's no treatment facilities for juvenile offenders, and the whole system's frustrated with that. In other words, the simple explanation of sex with which smaller children, you know, have explored as mm -hmm. youngsters, becomes a serious offense when it's an older child taking advantage of a healthy That's sentence. right. Like there's the, even all I went through, I still played doctor. You know, like all yeah. kids playing doctor, playing house. And I never thought anything about that. So I'm not saying that kind where it's peer groups. And it's, you show me yours, I'll show you mine type of thing. I'm talking about where there's a four year difference, where one is using more power over the other. But there is no way correct. to deal with a teenage offender. In That's right, and the, the system is really as mad as we are mm -hmm. and frustrated. Got to get into some phone calls. Now, if anything you want to see, jump in. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. That's right, go ahead. I uh, just uh, want to make a couple of comments and then I'll hang up. Uh, right. My uh, thoughts are that uh, a lot of this uh, could have been prevented years ago. Uh, our society uh, likes when these young children get pregnant, for these young children to keep children. And I would like to see some statistics put out on, uh, if uh, Nona could answer maybe how many kids that she has in her classes are from single parents and from uh, young women that have had uh, children when they've been 15, 16 and what have you. Like. Okay, teen moms and single parent families, eh? The living arrangements for the students from 1975 to 1983 at STEP UP, 38% uh, were with single parent mums, 8% uh, were with single parent dads. And so you're looking at a case where there are a lot of, of single parent mums out there trying very hard and not getting enough support and their kids are ending up in front of What about parents. these teen mums who keep their babies at 15? At one time, they were automatically adopted out. Right. Now it would seem the system seems to encourage 15-year-olds or 16-year-olds to keep their babies. Well, you know, that because... Do they finish up? Well, they don't all finish up as delinquents. Not at all, and we don't know what the data no. is on that, but what we do know, that if you teach them, uh, what most of the young 15-year-olds and 14-year-olds that I deal with who are pregnant, say to me was, well, you know, I'm, I'm pregnant and he's going to marry me and I'm going to live happily ever after. And that image is that, the, you know, that we raise our daughters to think that they've got to be looked after and they're dependent, and it's that whole Cinderella complex, Jack, that they're going to, you know, that they're going to live happily the rest of their lives as soon as they get pregnant. And so they get pregnant and they're going to keep that baby and they tell me time and time again, I'm going to do more for that child than it was ever done for me. And they've got this wonderful, wishful thinking that, that you know, the future is going to be perfect. And there's where you run into your trouble. Because they got no money, they're on welfare, That's they're right. alone, and God and the, knows. And the man's not going to marry them. No. We don't have that many that keep their children. Uh, the majority of teens we have been dealing with, especially lately, have had abortions. Yeah. Do you recommend that? We give them their options. We tell them what's available and what we do if a girl comes in pregnant, we have them sit down and write out the pros and cons of keeping the child, the pros and cons of giving the child up, and the decision's theirs. We will support them no matter Go what. Go ahead from Victoria. Hello, yeah. Speak up a bit. Hello. That's better. Yeah. Yeah, I myself was a graduate of our system in BC. I went through the courts and the group homes and everything else. And uh, it's, they're all useless, I mean, the systems we have, because there is no support systems, there are no educational systems, yes. and uh, anything else. I myself educated myself in, uh, in the penitentiary. I got a high school degree in the penitentiary, and then went to university when I got out. What was your basic problem in the beginning? 
Well, I didn't want any control. I didn't want anyone involved in my life or anything else, you know. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And the basic thing is, is what people seem to forget, is above all the troubles and everything else, we're still dealing with a child, and we're dealing with a child who's willful. And children, children have to be controlled. And what? if you have a child that is out of control and in trouble and in the system, then you've got to educate that child and you've got to make sure it sticks. You've got to, like, I don't know, build... Good point, but you don't recommend the pen uh, getting a high school graduation in the pen, do you? Well, certainly not. No, you've got to start before that. You've got to take them in the juvenile system when they're still uh, out of control, get them in a place where they can't move, where, they, where they're not on the streets, where they're no longer in control, and then start to work with them from there. You can't work with them by sticking them in a home if they're going to run away from it all the time. No, I think you both agree, wouldn't you? Yeah. Good, thanks. Kitty Matt, go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Morning. I take my hat off to your ladies that are there. Me too. Um, I've been trying for about four or five months to get hold of you on this subject. It's a real right. bomb. Um, I live in a small community here where there's a fireman, a principal, a bank manager, and so forth that are being charged with this problem. Um, what they're... I've, We've been keeping clippings of the paper um, for the last couple of weeks on child abuse, and it's unreal what the justice, the courts are doing. Uh, they're coming, I don't... giving these people three, four months sentencing. Are you talking about cases that have been over and dealt with in the courts? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I feel easier now. What kind of sentences or what kind of offenses? Well, I haven't got them here in front of me, Jack. I should have got them ready, but some of the sentences are three or four months sentencing for the uh, person doing the charges. But yet the kids are putting in years of sentencing with the amount of turning them. Uh, are these single offenses against people or are these multiple offenses? Multiple offenses. This is in Kitimat. In Kitimat, yeah. Also, you have uh, one sentencing here of a principal where the judge had the guts to sentence a gentleman. I'm sorry I don't have the information here, but I'm sure you can get it. The judge made the comment that it is not all the pro person's fault. The parents are also at fault. They should know where their children are. Well, hell, if your kids are in school, you know where they are, but when they go out to play basketball or whatever, what are you supposed to do? Follow them? And no. I think that was really low of the judge. Would you, would you kindly get me the local clippings and mail them to me so I can give them to Linda Halliday of Sava? Jack, I have a whole pile of clippings I'll gladly send you that have been coming out of the province for the last two or three weeks. Well, we could probably find them ourselves, but you can do it easier for me. I'll photocopy them and send them back. And thank you very much for your call. Thank you, Jack. Good. Bye. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, I want to talk to Linda, please. Well, hold on, and you'll be the first call to Linda after the break. Six, after the break. Take it away. Linda, go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, you know, Linda, recently I saw a TV documentary about prison inmates that were convicted of sexual offenses, mm -hmm. and they were on a special program. Through testing, they were found to have an exceptionally high degree of male hormone, which they, for this they were taking a drug which reduced the imbalance. All of those interviewed were unanimous that it's the only system that has worked for them. So you're quite right that we do need immediate treatment for these sexual offenders. I just want to give you a quick example. I was overseas in the Middle East last spring. On one of our tours, a lady lost her handbag while we were in Turkey. She was quite worried, but do you know, before the bus left the grounds, within 20 minutes, that handbag was returned to her. Our tour guide said, check everything out. Everything was in that purse. We were astounded. The, even the cash, $800. What's the model for us, though, on that? The model is this. Our tour guide said, there is a law in Turkey that you do not steal, because if you do, you will get your hands cut off. Well, that's the same in Saudi Arabia. We unfortunately <laughs> okay, cannot. Okay, so what we need, as she says, is stronger laws to protect the innocent children. Oh, I agree entirely, but we're not about to occur. No, I don't mean cutting off their hands. I'm just giving you a, a <laughs> 
example of how strongly we have to work for these changes. Of I, the I agree with you, ma'am, but I think that Nona thinks I'm a bit of an old heavy-handed person. <laughs> Well, we should castrate them if we get them into oh, the jails and they don't have any better sense. Just a I'm moment, please, ma'am. Comment on the castration bit. I knew that's what was coming. On the castration, I tend to disagree with that because these men, it's not the sexual part that's so interesting to them. It's the power and control. And I'm afraid with castration, there's a possibility that these offenders may become even more violent to gain that power and control. Not if that they were on medication, they wouldn't. Okay, ma'am, but we're not about to go castration and heavy medication to control sex offenders. Yeah. I see that the Pacific Regional Service is trying to set up a program at Mountain Prison yes, and where they want to demonstrate by uh, blood pressure techniques what, mm -hmm. uh, what causes these offenders to be aroused. Do you, yeah. Is that a good thing? Yeah, there's a conference coming to Vancouver at the end of March, and there's going to be experts from all over the states that have been dealing with sex offender programs for quite some time. And I am really pleased because it's about time that they all got together and looked at treatment and see what can be done. But surely the primary purpose of treatment, when we look at some of these tiny little hand slap offenses, is the protection of the public. Exactly. And the only way to protect the public... I'm talking about public, adult offenders now. Yeah, the only way to protect the public is there has to be some something to deter these men from doing it. And if they're going to be saying, hey, don't do it again, or you're a nice effect, a sex offender because you weren't violent. What was the case at Duncan, that one that made us all horrified, that ghastly case at Duncan where the guy is let out, oh. sex offender, and does a dreadful murder within a couple of days. That's right, and that always concerns us. Uh, there has to be an education you know, I process. i got to say my piece, the first consideration in dealing with dangerous sexual offenders, yes. whether it's a lifetime or not, has got to be the public. That's right. And, and the if victims. there ain't no cure, they not to come out again. And this they will not do because it violates their rights. Am I wrong? Well, are you, are you prepared to build bigger jails and house them with more people? Is that going to rehabilitate them? No, I think there are some cases like Olson, much as I hate even to mention the name, who cannot be rehabilitated, and I still get rev revulsed every time I see this fink going for further publicity because he'll discover no bodies. I think that's a man about, in this community should never, ever again see his face or mention his name if it costs us $10 million to put him away somewhere. Every time that stinker, that dreadful creature, says, I can find five more bodies, we all jump like mechanical monsters. Don't you agree with me on that? I have to agree with you on that. Bury him alive if necessary, but I mean, get him out of sight forever and a day. With the sex offenders, there has to be some way to protect the public. And if it, until they get a treatment program that they can mm. give us some protection from, there has to be a jail. It mustn't term. be diverted by the, my perpetual <laughs> annoyance at Olson. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Morning. Uh, yeah, I'm a youth coordinator, uh, activity coordinator. I've seen a lot of sexual abuse on kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, my feeling on the situation is that. Uh, in order, it seems like in order for us to uh, get any of these charges to stick or to get any sentences out of the deal, it has to escalate. Just like in the drugs or in murders and things, it seems things have to escalate. So what I'm just saying is um, that we should prepare the people in different social services, um, different community centers, and things like that to, to look for the sexual abuse and to um, come out and talk about it because I don't think we're going to get people who are into incest and families because they're in love with their parents and, and in love with their grandparents to come out and talk about it. Um, I feel that the only other way that we can do it is um, getting the people in different social services to be able to... Oh, I'll let them. I'll let them, yes. And the other thing you said, I think both our people here would agree with, when it comes to offenses, a single offense is never enough for a case of, where a young, young person has evolved in need of a pattern of it. Eh? Oh, so, no, sometimes there is enough evidence with a single case. You mean with an admission of guilt? Not even with an admission of guilt. We have had ones where there's been one child, but the mom might remember something about him coming out of the bedroom or walking in on it. Sometimes there is evidence once it's investigated. Um, we have seen, we have seen five-year-old kids testify on the stand, and we found if they're prepared properly, it's very therapeutical for them, and we found that re they recover much quicker than the kids that never have their day in court. But your people, you're, are you at your maximum capacity now? Oh, and a long waiting list, Jack. How many on the waiting list? About 200, usually about two years to get into step up. 
Now, you're, has, your, has your budget been approved because you, you no, operate under the Attorney General's budget? And, and the Vancouver School Board. I'm, I'm a teacher with the Vancouver School Board. Not yet, Jack. But it looks good. We don't know until the budget comes down. We oh. wait year to year for budget approval. When will you hear about your budget? I don't know. But oh. Step Up is the most successful school in North America. Good. And Linda's is the most successful uh, association of volunteers, so-called anonymous. <laughs> Victims, anonymous. <laughs> yes. After the break. Yeah. My thanks to the patient callers. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Oh, hello. Um, That's you. I'm a victim, too, of incest, you know. Uh-huh. And I was wondering, like, I dealt with my brother and my father on this, but my brother seems to put me down for what he did. Yeah. How can I deal with that? Linda? That's very common. The, the most important thing is to deal with your own feelings and your own abuse, and then you can deal with him. Uh, I've had to cut my father totally out because if I didn't, I couldn't cope emotionally. Yeah, I like don't I see can't him. find my father now, but I really don't care if I find him. I want to find him, but I'm scared to find him. Yeah. I'm and afraid to face him, I guess, you know? The hardest part is you have to let go of the abuse, and you have to start learning that, yes, you were abused, but this is now, and you have to start dealing with now and taking responsibility for your actions. With your brother, if you can't cope with him, then you should look at maybe not, not having him around you. Yeah, but doesn't your family put you down if you do that? My family has totally left me. I have one sister that talks to me. I've been asked to stay away from family funerals. I've asked them to stay away from family reunions. But that is something that I have been willing to give up so that I feel okay about me. How old are you, Carla? I'm 29, and, you're and I've been abused quite a bit in my life since I was nine years old, and I don't know why. This is, it just happens. It just, and now I married two years ago, mm -hmm. and since I married, nothing's happened because my husband really looks out for me, you know. But right. my brother's still in the picture, and my husband has a hard time dealing with my brother also. Oh, yeah. oh. write to me. Right. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to know where to write to you. Okay, really. the address will be up shortly. Go get yourself a pencil. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. How are you? Good. That's good. <laughs> what I'm calling about, this is in reference to Linda. I give you a lot of credit. Uh, when I was very young, I was about three years old, uh, I was a, uh, sexually abused by a friend of my grandfather's. Mm -hmm. And according to my mother, I had told her, but I didn't remember. I guess I just blocked it off somewhere. Two years ago, I had a nervous breakdown and a lot of things came out. I was also abused in my marriage. And I thought it was that, that you know, I, I always believed, well, you can't talk about it. Who's going to believe you? Maybe I deserved it. Well, once I got over the breakdown and once I got my stuff together, I realized now that what went on, I'm okay now. I'm happy for that. But I, the fellow that abused me when I was three, he's dead and gone. But it bothers me. I wonder what it was. Was I doing something wrong or not? Yeah. And I realized, no, I wasn't. But I really believe that I, inside myself, I really think that the system, I think the people outside of your home, such as Ministry of Human Resources, the courts, I think they need to be educated. I think more people that Linda, have been abused have only got have a to come forward. One thing I'd really recommend people to do Tell the government how outraged you are at what's happening. I can't do it by myself. They need to hear that people do not like what's happening and they're willing to put their name on a piece of paper and send it to federal, provincial, anybody that'll listen. I can't do it myself. I have, the I have your address, Linda, and I definitely will write to you. Thanks a I... lot, my dear. Go ahead from Victoria. Hello, yes. Um, my uh, experience has been since nine, nine years old. Mm -hmm. I'm 31 now. Uh, oh God, I'm from there. Um, Take it easy. Is my mother knew from the first time? Mm -hmm. uh, why don't more mothers turn in? Fathers. There's a question. Why don't more mothers? I've always taken it as okay. an axiom from court coverage that where there was incest, the mother knew about it. 90% of mothers that we've handled will not support the child. They will kick the husband out. You've got to realize that 
of the mothers of victims I have dealt with were sexual abuse victims themselves. And if they have never dealt with their own abuse, how are they ever going to deal with their daughters? But surely to God, any normal mother, when she finds her husband... Let me give you an example. Kids will... Someone that's been married 15 years. This guy is terrific. Good provider, always been there, very supportive. She's got a 14-year-old daughter. For the last two years, she's been running around, sleeping around, lying, stealing, the whole number. Now, one morning, the 14-year-old gets up and says, Hey, Mom, Dad's been abusing me. Now, in that split second, Mom has to make up her mind. Who's she going to believe? This kid that's been nothing but trouble for two years or this husband who's been so terrific to her? And the system is not geared for mothers to support their children. How can you children. ever find the truth in that? Uh, kids don't lie about it. Okay. Hold your breath, everybody. This is a sample of the... The spelling ability of a 13 and a half year old now graduating from Step Up School, Nona. Steak plate, name made Kate Gate, Kane Cage Hate, and same. And doing very well, age 13 and a half, and that's his spelling ability. And Linda has a letter here from a girl, a 14 year old, who's twice counseled by Sava. You deserve a trophy for being excellent counselors. I love you. Reality is for people who can cope. This girl can now cope and can face reality. The two addresses, Sava. Sava, R1, Campbell River, BC, V9W3S4. And Step Up School, 550 West 10th, Vancouver, BC, V5Z1L2, 8742411. My grateful thanks to each of you. Thank you. I shall be back after the break. Your chance to have at Mark Lalonde, the power in the Liberal government at Ottawa, the Minister of Finance, tomorrow morning. He will be followed by happenstance, but appropriately by Pat Carney of the Tory party, who knows a thing or two about finance. So it's Lalonde followed by Carney, tomorrow on Webster at 9 a.m. precisely.